He provides education and treatment internationally for relationship development and the prevention and treatment of relationship violence.
five research trends of domestic violence that everyone needs to know, beginning with one size does not fit all. Those of you who have been working in this field know that there was a time uh, when we thought we had really a profile. But there was a profile for what a domestic violence offender looked like, what a couple looked like in which domestic violence was taking place. And that profile was there was this guy who was driven by power and control needs, who was influenced by the male patriarchal society, who was entitled and dominant and was influenced, whose behavior was expressing, uh, was using a, a whole pattern of control tactics to keep the woman in his life in line, to keep her serving him in various emotional ways, sexual ways, uh, 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 taking care of the, you know, the behavioral ways, of taking care of physical needs, etc. And a woman who was in a uh, who was submissive in a submissive role in that relationship, uh, who was terrorized and dominated, afraid to leave. This couple, this still unfortunately exists, and we know, and, and everybody who works in this field, or even everybody who just has who, who knows about, uh, even if you're not in this field, who knows uh, who's had contact with domestic violence know that most particular guys do exist, and women who feel really trapped in that kind of relationship definitely exist. However, we also know that there are a lot of other shapes, sizes, uh, ethnicities, gender orientations, and genders of domestic violence, the in which domestic violence can come, and it's been extremely valuable, particularly over the last 10 or 15 years, to really get some clearer and clearer ideas about some of the different types and the different motivations and the different situations people in, the different capacities people have for being rehabilitatable uh, and for uh, the different effects on, on victims and kids, etc. And I want to try to give you some of what I consider to be the highlights of what the current research is really showing about some of those key distinctions. It's not one size that fits all. Not all batterers are truly considered batterers. There's a difference between committing an act of domestic violence that might be destructive and unacceptable and illegal and being a true batterer. And I'm going to try to talk about those categories here. Uh, Michael Johnson is a researcher at uh, I don't remember where it's, I think it's University of Pennsylvania. In the mid-90s, he developed uh, a distinction between two different types of domestic violence, what he called his original term for this was called patriarchal terrorism. And then in the, in the other category, it was originally called common couple violence. He has since upgraded the research and, and the terms, and he's added a lot more components to it. The terms he has used now is what's called intimate partner terrorism uh, and situational couple violence. And I want to make sure you understand the, the two different uh, categories he's talking about. It. He's, he, according to him, uh, it is, it is really a mistake for us to view all domestic violence as either one of these two, and many people fall into that. Many people, unfortunately, are still thinking of them as either one or the other. There are, well, there are different types. Uh, this first type, now called intimate partner terrorism, changed into the patriarchal because there are at least a few females who are capable of this, although in this category, I, I wouldn't give an exact number, but I'd say we're talking about 98 to 2 in terms of uh, male to female ratio. The other category is quite a different balance, but in this category is almost exclusively male. When we think of classic wife beaters, batterers, well, spouse abusers, uh, well, domestic violence is actually a broader term. I should probably change that. Yeah, this is the guy we're thinking of. Somebody who systematically and uh, comprehensively engages in a number of different tactics to terrorize and control his almost always female partner. So when we use the term batterer, this is what we're talking about. Uh, in in uh, community samples in which domestic violence is identified, this is not a criminal population we're talking about, but this is when you go into communities and you know, ask in sort of census type surveys with uh, like the conflict tactics scale, which I'll be talking about in a few minutes. Uh, and, you get, and, you, and you identify families in which there has been incidents of domestic violence. If you go in further, approximately 10% of these couples would fit the profile of the uh, 
intimate partner terrorists. The other 90% are in the public category. If, however, you go into another population, let's say the women's shelters, and you interview women there and you, and you get information about the relationship they're in, approximately 74% of that sample would, would fit the category for intimate partner terrorism. I don't have the numbers for this exactly, but I can tell you my, my impression. If you look at uh, the sort of a, a group of uh, men who are convicted of domestic violence, not, not where it's been so bad off that the women's had to go to a shelter, the men who are who enter the system in one way of domestic violence, I think we're talking approximately about 20% might be in the, in the uh, intimate partner terrorism category, and another 80% in situational couple violence. The first category, intimate partner terrorism, or generally called patriarchal terrorism, is best understood from looking at the, the feminist perspective that developed in the 70s and understanding the domestic violence. It's based on the theory that they're on the power and control model. And for those of you familiar with the field, this is the Duluth model that, uh, that originated with you know, the onset of a feminist perspective of, of gender politics. It was a, it advanced the field of domestic violence in ways that, are, that were astronomical and that we're still really benefiting from. Uh, and the best way to, to make sense out of this particular kind of domestic violence is through that particular lens. You've got the, the profile I was describing before. This dominant male figure who is determined to control and manipulate and use the female in whatever way seems convenient or seems, seems to meet his needs. Uh, the primary abuser in this, uh, in, in this category is almost always male. Uh, the violence is more frequent and severe and less likely to stop compared to the other category of domestic violence. Uh, the primary abuser forcibly controls the partner. I'll define that term course of control in just a second. Uh, the female violence that takes place in this couple is usually considered to be a, uh, only takes place in acts of self-defense. Either truly legal self-defense, you know, like somebody's coming at me and I'm doing whatever I can to stop myself from being hurt, like grabbing a knife or something, or something that's, uh, that's a little tricky in the legal field, but it's certainly psychologically we get it, like the burning bed type of self-defense, where if you don't remember the burning bed story, at that moment she was not in jeopardy, so it wasn't what did, it, it was iffy about whether or not she meant the legal definition of self-defense. But by all practical terms, this woman. Was she was not a violent person who was trying to express anger towards her husband. She was feeling terrorized and felt like it was only a matter of time before she and her kids might be dead. And so the motivation for that aggression was self-defense. Uh, the power and control themes run rampant. And what we hear from women in this, uh, who, who are in, in this kind of a relationship, all he had to do was look at me that way, and I would do whatever he wanted. We hear this from victims all the time, that it doesn't take necessarily a whole lot of actual violence. It takes maybe a single act of violence once, and a lot of other threatening behavior, and a lot of other controlled behavior to keep that, to keep that person in line. Uh, and it represents a larger system of subordination and control of women. And part of this is based on a, on a uh, feminist perspective of our society as being which, which, uh, a male dominant, uh, men, men using aggression to get their needs met, men using women as objects, etc. And then it trickles down in some way to the, to the men who engage in this kind of domestic violence. That's the first category. The other broad category that Johnson has, has really uh, tried to describe here <coughs> is now called situational couple violence. The best way to understand this kind of domestic violence is not so much through the feminist theory and uh, the power and control theory, but through family conflict theory, looking at more of a psychological model. Something goes wrong in this relationship, somebody behaves poorly. Uh, every one of us knows this particular mechanism. Whether there's been violence in your relationship or not, every one of us knows what it's like to feel hurt, offended, frustrated, threatened in some way in our most intimate relationship. And as a result of that, to act destructively to say something, to be sarcastic, to withdraw, to get controlling, to, to, uh, to behave in some way that's retaliatory towards our, our partner. I think most of us, if we are honest, 
we can identify certain ways in which that, uh, that has taken place in our own relationship and that we're, we are all capable of doing that under certain circumstances. This represents that kind of pattern really run amok with uh, where the person not only gets like what I might get, which is sarcastic, um, they might they also they take it to another level called violent. But the mechanism is basically similar. It's somebody has has felt hurt or frustrated in, in some way in this relationship, and it brings out some negative or destructive qualities, unfortunately leading to uh, <coughs> how they end up in our world here. Uh, the understanding of it is based on a systems or psychological theory. Uh, the violence in these categories, and I'm going to get into this the more the research about this, is initiated approximately equally by men and by women. Now, this doesn't mean that the impact is the same. I'm going to talk about some of those, uh, some of the ways to make sense out of the stats, but it's still a very significant piece of information. That in, what we have here is the actual first blow with a push, a shove, or whatever is approximately equal male to female. The violence is less frequent and not as severe as in the first group, the patriarchal terror, the intimate partner terrorism group. It is not characterized by a pattern of coercive control. Let me explain what that means. If, uh, if God forbid, I get into some argument with my wife and I just get so frustrated with her, I just grab her and push her against the refrigerator or, or slap her or something. That would be horrible, and um, I may not be a married man anymore, and I may end up in jail. However, it would not represent a pattern of coercive control in a relationship, because that doesn't exist. If you look at our relationship, it's there's a, basically an equality. What it would represent is I had a bad day, and I did not control, and I was and something got got pushed for me emotionally, and I lost it, which is unacceptable behavior, but the mechanisms or the reasons for it are very important, both in terms of trying to make sense out of it, I mean, in trying to, uh, to make sense of who this person is, and also in terms of what to do about it. Uh, the, the course of control would not be the, 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 my behavior would not be motivated by trying to overall control her. Right that minute, right that second, I might want to have her understand what I'm trying to say, so in that sense it's a brief attempt at control, but not a pattern. Of control. That's a very, very important distinction to uh, in looking at the cases that we see. Uh, it is considered to be one of many tactics used by partners to express conflict and disagreement. It's, uh, we'll talk a little bit more later about the motivations for domestic violence, but basically what we're seeing is somebody saying, oh, I just I couldn't, it's the only way I could get through to her. It's the only way, he, he, he was about to leave me and I just wanted to let him know he couldn't do that. It's, it's people feeling frustrated and doing something rather desperate, unfortunately, that has destructive consequences. Uh, one of the other researchers uh, who talks about these, this kind of category, this kind of couple, uh, describes these acts of aggression as an expressive, misguided, cathartic response. Which, if we, I think if we're honest with ourselves, we all at times have expressive misguided, cathartic responses in our most intimate relationships with our kids, with our partners. Uh, coercive control, uh, one good working for definition for this is the following. Non-physical tactics used by abusers to maintain control over their partners. And if you know the, the power and control wheel from the Duluth model, uh, intimidation, isolation, economic control, controlling partner's activities and decisions, undermining her, or in some cases, his self-esteem, playing mind games, doing, doing things to really get inside that person's, get inside that person's head and, and be in this controlling position. Certain acts of domestic violence are generated primarily by course of control. Many, I would say most, in my experience, are, not, are motivated by something, but not necessarily this is the main explanation. Um, Johnson says the two types of violence uh, aren't defined by the nature or frequency of the violent acts, although it's definitely true that in the intimate partner terrorism group, the violence is usually more frequent and usually more severe. Uh, but the key thing is this last term, 
Intimate terrorism is violence that is embedded in a general pattern of control. That is the MO here. That's the theme. Situational level violence is not. It's got a lot. Of, it's got. It's got problems. It causes. Uh, um, can cause physical and psychological injury. It can ruin relationships and get people thrown in jail. But it's not necessarily explained by a pattern of course of an attempt at coercive control. Uh, The uh, intimate partner terrorism usually takes place more frequently simply because, if you think about it, if, if, my, if I'm driven by this course of control thing, there can be a lot of situations where I'm going to want to make sure that my wife conforms to something that I'm looking for. So it just gives me more, there, there's more time, more opportunity for me to want to use violence. And that seems to lead to a, a greater increase both in frequency as well as intensity. But it's also important to know that some intimate partner terrorists gain control without ever resorting to violence or only occasional acts of violence. And I've testified in some very uh, tricky forensic cases where part of the, the defense was better women said over it. Now it's called domestic violence and its effects. But the actual the abuser, these accused are homicide cases where the woman has killed her husband, and part of the defense is the, is the better women thing. Uh, but, but the abuser has only slightly, I mean in our terms, hardly at all, been violent with her. It's not the classic case where she's feared for her life, but he's, he's scored way high on all these other measures of course and control. And it's a real tricky legal, this is a legal issue about whether or not that can uh, be used as, it's not, not to legitimize the violence, but to, in these cases it was more to is it, you know, first degree murder or manslaughter or some other, or some other lesser charge. So the, the important point here is that the actual acts of violence, although it's greater in the intimate partner terrorist group, is not necessarily the only predictor. It's not, not the only thing that decides. It and similarly, a lot of situational couple of violence, even if I didn't mean to really hurt her, can turn out to, to lead to some really horrible stuff, including homicide, or certainly including some pretty nasty you know, beatings, uh, which which I've certainly come across, um, motivated by some person who, for the most part, is not a, a power and control freak, but who just lost his, or in some, some cases, her temper in a way that is unacceptable, that it, that it ain't power and control. That's not, in those cases, not the way to understand it. The two groups differ in dangerousness, um, in terms of the dynamics of the violence, and the presence or absence of a personality disorder. Here's a pop quiz for those of you in the mental health field. Which of those two categories do you think has a much greater uh, presence of personality disorder, access to personality disorders? The first one is, is the answer, is the correct answer. You see a lot of antisocial personality disorders, narcissistic personality, borderline personalities, you know, some of the toughest things that in the mental health field we have to deal with, and some of the more intractable cases that are that are harder to uh, rehab in some ways. Whereas in, in the other group, there may certainly may be some, but it's a much, it, it's, it shows up much less. And the intervention of choice, depending upon who we're dealing with, can range anything from the good old fashioned uh, intervention known as jail, um, or what is more typically done uh, in, in California and other states, there's like a court mandated group counseling program on, you know, on probation, well, supervised by, by uh, probation or the court, uh, or in some cases, uh, couples uh, interventions. And I'll be, I'll be talking again before you all get excited about this couples thing. I'll, I'll be talking about some of the, the, um, the restrictions on the possibility of couples interventions. But I, I want to at least leave that door open because there's, there, there are cases in which um, if we have the option to do it, it could come in handy. Well, that's my professional thing to know. Try to back it up later on. Um, before we can talk a little bit more about some of the differences, let me just tell you what the research is currently showing about the similarities. In other words, you've got you take a thousand guys convict, uh, uh, convicted of domestic violence charge, and then you take a thousand other guys who are similar to them in every way except for the domestic violence. What you would find in the thousand domestic violence guys are is, is evidence of some of the following. Well, 
they hold attitudes that evaluate the use of force less negatively. In other words, it's not that big deal, it's big a deal to slap somebody around sometimes when you want to get your point across. It's the attitudes that the rest of the society might have uh, will be more, more uh, alarmed by violence. You can find less of that attitude here. Uh, they distort the causes and the consequences of behavior. Distorting the causes would be like, uh, well, you know, anybody would, if, you, if your wife just, you know, really nagged you and controlled you all the time like this, anybody would have reacted like that. That's distorting a cause. Distorting a consequence might be, uh, well, you know those marks on her arm? She just bruises easily. Or, uh, my favorite one, it's been like three weeks since I've done anything threatening or intimidating to her and she still acts like she's scared of me. <laughs> You're not really paying attention to the consequence of violent, threatening, controlling type behavior and how long lasting those trauma from that can be. Uh, assume, assuming greater partner negative intent. What you typically find with our domestic violence guys is that in situations that could be interpreted different ways, in personal situations, they're likely to choose the worst, at least the worst in terms of uh, how they understand their partner. Uh, I'm supposed to meet my wife somewhere and she's late. If I'm thinking more like a domestic violence guy than typically would think according to this research, I, what, what, what the thoughts went through my head would be more likely things like, she's always disrespected me, she doesn't care about me. She's, this, this is just one more example of how I just can't count on her at all. As opposed to, uh, gee, traffic might be bad, or maybe something was happening with the kids and it took a while to get everything together, or even, I know my wife's kind of sloppy about time, oh well, uh, I ain't perfect either. I mean, something you could be irritated by that, but not necessarily put in this box called, she's purposely trying to mess with me, or, trying, or, or making me wait and insulting me in this way. Those are the attitudes you're more likely to hear from our TV guys, and you can see once you get, once you cop that attitude, it's not too many more steps until you want to do something to retaliate to the person who has done this to you, and it seems justified at that moment. Uh, less able to use reasoning, just like thinking ahead about the consequences of behavior. Higher levels of arousal in response to conflict, although there's some exceptions about that, I'll talk about that in a second. Higher generalized anger and hostility, and they label many forms of negative affect as anger. <coughs> One of the things that we're always trying to do in any kind of domestic violence treatment program with guys is to help, is to, to teach them about how boys in our society uh, learn really early on, you know, you're supposed to hold a lot of feelings in. Girls, there's a lot of research about this, that girls get trained more to identify emotions and, and engage in conversations that are more feeling oriented. And, uh, and, and one of the handicaps that men have as, as an adult is, it, they're, when it comes to the complexity of relationships, they often don't know what emotions they're experiencing. They just know something's wrong. And I'm, so one of the things we want to do is to help educate them more about the range of different emotions and have language that can appropriately express that. And I inevitably get some guy in my group who said, who raises his hand and says, I'm really good at expressing my feelings. I tell my wife I'm pissed off at her all the time. <laughs> and, and we say, well, okay, anger is one feeling that there's a time and place to be expressing anger. We're talking also about the 414 other feelings that we want to make sure that you're aware of and can identify. And uh, part of what happens for, for, I think, men in general, but even more so these men, is that uh, there's something unmasculine about a lot of different emotions. I mean, an emotion like anxiety does not feel very masculine. An emotion like uh, feeling sad it says you sort of feel impotent, you feel, that's, that's the worst word. Uh, you feel, or you feel powerless, or frustrated, or hurt, or threatened. These do not feel like, these don't fit the profile of masculine self-image. Anger, anger has power attached to it. That's, that's, that, that's an emotion that's acceptable for men to experience. But not some of this other stuff. So, uh, and these men in particular are very quick to, whenever any uncomfortable emotion emerges, it's called, they call it anger, and react to it in their heads as if something's just happened that justifies their anger, and you know, you gotta respond or retaliate in some way. Now, another uh, typology that I'm gonna, I wanna spend a few minutes on 
to help understand the, uh, the different types of people we're dealing with. By the way, right now we're just talking about research on the following population, male, adult, heterosexual, domestic violence offenders. So this research is not specifically about females, about adolescents, or about uh, gay and lesbian domestic violence offenders, although much of this could overlap to them, but to, these, to the other groups, um, we just don't have the same kind of hard data that we do about the classic group, the, the straight male guy, the straight male adults who commit acts of domestic violence. But there's a researcher at Indiana University, uh, Amy Holdsworth Monroe. And by the way, uh, you don't have the references for this, but anybody who's interested in any of these studies I quote or whatever, uh, there's a, uh, if you email me, I'll send you my list of you know, references and ask people like you know, Michael Johnson, Amy Holzer, and some of these other people that I've studied you know, that I'm quoting. Uh, and I'll make sure that you have access to, the, to it if you want to look more carefully. Uh, Uh, she, her, her research at Indiana University has been some of the best research that I've ever seen in terms of really trying to identify some of these different types in some more detail. So in addition to the Michael Johnson categories we just talked about, intimate partner terrorism and situational couple violence, that's one way to conceptualize who we're dealing with here and the different types. Another typology that I think comes in handy is the following. I'm going to try to do this pretty quick, uh, a brief overview simply because of time, because we're still on number, item number one uh, of our five domestic violence and five pieces of research in the field. Um, but she's identified three main categories. And she sits in her most recent research, research added a fourth, which is kind of a, a midpoint between uh, a couple of the other ones. It's not as significant in terms of just the conceptualization. Let me give you an education about the first three. Number one, generally violent aggressor or generally violent antisocial. These are the guys who are who are violent not only with their wife or partner, but also have usually have some sort of delinquent history, criminal history, get into bar fights, have an attitude, often uh, get, uh, can't make it into the job field because they get into arguments or have attitude problems. And the violence that we see is something that is just part of their life or personality that happens to spill over into their their life with their uh, wife or girlfriend. Um, and they usually been raised in an environment which has condoned or in some ways uh, just trained them essentially to have those kinds of, uh, of attitudes. Um, generally antisocial, they engage in what's called instrumental violence. For those of you not familiar with that term, that means violence with a purpose. If I go into 7-Eleven and I'm going to try to I don't want to get some money out of that clerk, I'm not mad at that clerk. I got nothing against this guy. I using violence to get some get my way. That's the motivation for these guys. They would it's the part of the coercive control thing. I've got an agenda here, and I'm going to use what my power to or my threatening behavior to achieve that uh, the goals of that agenda. Uh, more belligerent, we're using substances. You, got, you have the information there. Um, and what key here is they show little remorse and they're limited in their capacity for empathy and attachment. The problem here is under attachment. The reason, if I'm one of these guys, the reason I can hurt you is because when you get right down to it, I don't really care. I don't really feel that feel your pain enough to inhibit me from doing something that, that would hurt you. And that under attachment is uh, sort of uh, opens up, is it serves as a disinhibitor. It, it releases the governor on a lot of behavior because I don't really care if you're going to suffer. I might care about going to jail. I might care about uh, having you leave me. <coughs> There's things I do care about. But how you actually feel, that's not high on my priorities. And that, that opens the door for possible violence when I feel like it. Um, if you're looking for a poster child for this category, I'm not going to tell you the guy's name. You might be able to figure it out. He was a famous heavyweight boxer in the 90s, primarily. And you know, if you pay him enough money, he'd go and, he'd go and beat, some, beat the crap out of somebody in the ring. It was part of his job. And if a particular boxing match wasn't going his way, he might decide to, let's say, oh, I don't know, bite somebody's ear off. <laughs> or uh, if you're a girl and you're flirting with him and you go up to his hotel room, you're likely to have sex whether you want to or not. 
because that's on his agenda and that's going to happen. And you know, in other situations, if you cross him, he's just he's likely to go off on you if he feels like it, because what you the effect on other people does not really affect him that much. He's affected by you know losing his going to jail or losing his boxing license. Um, I will say that in case you're trying to guess who this is, yeah, this is not Muhammad Ali. And I say that partly as a joke, of course, but also to remind you that you cannot tell a book by its cover. You can't say, okay, some guy who makes his living by beating the crap out of people, he must be some thug. He must be one of these generally violent antisocial guys. Well, Muhammad Ali hardly fits the criteria of being a generally violent antisocial person. He's somebody who made his living by boxing. Um, and this, the other gentleman we're referring to really does more fit this kind of profile. You cannot tell just by the act alone who, we're de who you're dealing with. Uh, next category is called uh, family only. Here you have the guys, and this is the bulk of the population of domestic violence offenders. Here you have the, the guys who are only aggressive in the context of their relationship. Something about the complexities and frustrations of dealing with intimate partner issues rattles this guy and he ends up behaving in a way that brings him into our world in some way in the domestic violence world or affects people, other people in the family. Uh, but uh, in general, what you've got with these guys is that there's not much evidence of psychopathology. If you give them all the MMPI, which is the standard personality test, or the Milan adult personality inventory, and you take another group of guys who are not domestic violence guys, you're not going to see big differences here. Whereas you will in the first category, the antisocial guys, you'll still see big spikes there. Um, they have what's called a passive aggressive style and over controlled hostility. You'll often see guys in here who feel very much outmaneuvered by the more, much more verbal, uh, verbally skilled female partner in their life. They feel like they get into arguments and she just somehow is able to, she hammers away at him more effectively than he can. He doesn't know how to answer her. She's seen Dr. Phil and read the self-help books and when he, when he shuts down, he, she accuses him of some label that she, he, she accuses him of and he doesn't know how to respond to it. And he bottles up a lot of stuff and at some point he feels really frustrated. He, something boils over and he loses it and uh, responds to her. Now, no, the, the fact that things led up to it doesn't, of course, does not mean that it was her fault. That, that's not at all my point. But I'm just trying to explain there are different triggers for people. And here the trigger is a guy who feels, or often who feels unequipped, ill-equipped to deal with the complexities of relationships and often needs a lot of skills in that department as opposed to a whole personality overhaul, which is what, more of what we'd be dealing with in the first category. Uh, these guys are generally remorseful. Here you find the guys who say, I can't believe I did that. That's not the kind of man I want to be. I don't want to lose my wife. I can't believe my kids. I ever had to see that again. I, I, have, I had to see that. I never want them to see that again. Um, the third category is the most psychologically complex. It's called emotionally dysphoric borderline. And for those of you familiar with the borderline personality disorder uh, diagnosis, uh, you don't have to be a full-fledged borderline according to the, the DSM-4 to be in this category. But this term is used because it, it uh, captures some of the flavor, some of the issues that are present in this particular subtype. These people are particularly sensitized to threats of abandonment or, or some sort of uh, loss of the partner. Whether it's an actual loss, like she's leaving me, or even just a loss of her affection or attention or approval or being sexually interested in me, any of those things. Um, these, um, there's a lot more emotional volatility. They tend to be violent only within the family, although uh, there can be some spillover because a lot of the people in this category have, are very impulsive and reactive, and it sometimes can take place outside of the family context, but they're most affected by the emotionally intense relationships that they are in, like their love relationship or relationship with also with their kids. And they exhibit the highest levels of anger, depression, Jealousy, also anxiety, fears of abandonment, uh, the threats to self-esteem. 
and these things serve as triggers. They find ways of misinterpreting their partners, blaming their partners for their own mistakes. I'm feeling, uh, I'm, since I'm feeling down, you must be doing something to make me feel this way. If, all, if you gave me more attention, more sex, more treated me differently, and you were a different person, I wouldn't be feeling this way. And you can imagine, once that gets locked into your brain as a story, an explanation for what's happening, it can start to feel justified that you want to retaliate against the person who is who's responsible for you feeling this bad. Depression, feelings of inadequacy, and they're typically the most severely abused as children. Yes. Can I clarify? Are you saying they are more severely abused than the intimate partner terrorist group that have the person's severe personality disorders? Uh, actually, that, that's a very good question. The, the research shows that that's about equal. It's the, the, both of those groups, the, the first group, the generally violent antisocial, and this group, emotionally dysphoric borderline, all, both have high levels of being abused as children. And so actually, some of the research that's from recently, I should probably change that most severely abused, it would be, should be highly severely abused. But it is definitely more than the family only group. The family only group does not have the, all these spikes in classic psychopathology uh, indicators like histories of abuse, for instance, that we see. But I'm glad you clarified that. Um, let's see. What we've got here, with her typologies, she ends up now with four typologies. I never know how to set up this chart, but uh, the one I didn't talk about was called low-level antisocial. Forget this one for a second. If I'm a guy who's busted for domestic violence, and I'm assessed according to, to the various measures that are used to put people into these categories, and I'm high in generality of violence, this happens more than just the whole, severity of violence, frequency of violence, and high in antisocial traits, I'll be classified as the generally violent aggressor or generally violent antisocial. If I'm busted for domestic violence and I score pretty low on all these things, I'll be classified as family only. If I'm somewhere sort of in between, I got a little mix of some of these things, I'll be in this new category called low-level antisocial. This is just sort of a, she created this category because a lot of people didn't fall exactly here or here. It wasn't, the split was too severe. And this is a midpoint category. This fourth category, emotionally dysphoric borderline, is reserved for people who have a particular cluster emotional issues who are really high on these the issues of anger, depression, anxiety, jealousy, fear of abandonment, the classic borderline kind of issues that seems to motivate the behaviors. What we know is that the two categories that are most difficult to treat and most likely to recidivate is are, are the generally violent and so, uh, generally violent aggressor group and the emotionally dysphoric borderline group. Those are the most deeply entrenched personality styles that lead to domestic violence that are toughest to get through. The good news is the vast majority of uh, men whom we see convicted for domestic violence fall more, fall, fall more in those other categories, family only, all the low-level antisocial. So uh, if we only had uh, X amount of dollars or resources and we wanted to do the most possible to try to uh, to control domestic violence, we would target off for the more severe cases. However, if we did that, I'm not sure our track record is not that great. We're actually making a difference in, in those groups. So, uh, in some ways, you can make an argument the other way: put your money, put our money, or our resources where we think we can have the most impact. And with the family-only guys, we have a lot of impact. A lot of these guys, even though they've done bad things, can be really uh, turned around by a lot of the, the interventions. I'm afraid to ask the following question. Are there any questions about any of this? Okay, let's <laughs> uh, is there, you have a quick question? Yeah, we have, we, she, she and I are both prosecutors. We have tons of questions because we are the ones that send all of these batterers to the same program and they're all grouped together right. and that's all we can do right now that's but correct. you know in a, in a what do you suggest what well, can we do that's changed the, the, the biggest i guess what i did what i should have put up here is another research trend is uh, matching trying to find a way to match typology <coughs> to, to have to, to if we can identify a guy as being in a certain category or, or understanding it 
to set up a treatment that's specific to that particular group. You, know, you might say that to the hardcore, more psychopathic types, the treatment plan is known as jail. And to the, 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 the family-only only types, it might be more like the traditional model we're using now, which is a, a, a usually a cognitive behavioral model influenced by Duluth, uh, you know, how, you know, understanding how to control. And with the emotionally dysphoric borderline, uh, if I were emperor, what I would do is, is have a more intensive, psychologically based intervention for them. In other words, have a combination of group intervention and individual therapy extended for a longer period of time because those issues run deep. But in most places, those those finely tuned different options do not yet exist. And so it, my recommendation is keep doing what we're doing. But some guys were getting success and some guys were not. So, I can't take my question, I'm way off track, but. I was just gonna say this, nobody's assessing. And it's the same with yeah. typologies of yeah. child abusers. You know, we in the child abuse field have the same problem because there's lots of differences in the people that abuse their kids. Right. And the assessment component for that one, I think, is not good. The, the, the question I follow up that I had was, who would you see as making this determination as to which type of batterer there are, which type of child abuse? Who would be the natural agency? There's, well, I can tell you, there's two obvious points in the system when that can happen. If there's a probation officer involved, a probation officer can, can be trained to do this assessment. Okay, but, in, but, but in misdemeanors, there is no probation officer. Then, so in the vast uh, majority of cases, there is no. Then the, the, the treatment agency uh, can, uh, either should, should, or if they're not, certainly can be have training to be able to make these kinds of assessments and try to uh, tailor uh, the treatment plan to that uh, individual. All right. We got 30 seconds now. Uh, really quick, with those typologies yeah. and, and looking at it again from a criminal point of view, you have the family only typology, which is really going to be, when you look at their criminal history, is really battery and domestic violence. Um, is there a way, by using their criminal histories, to maybe um, sort through it? Is the person who's the um, the last category, the burden, the, the, are, do they have a, a more because of their of their description, a more varied um, grocery store shelves full of different types of criminal crimes that well, they're if, doing. If, if we were strictly looking at uh, evidence, criminal history, record, criminal record, the generally violent aggressive group would have the highest criminal records. The emotionally dysphoric borderline might have some. The family only is likely to have zero. But part of what, what contributes to that category, generally a violent aggressor, is a history of engaging in anti-protective antisocial behavior, maybe gang behavior, juvenile delinquency, like I said, bar fights, other kinds of you know, getting fired from jobs for um, you know, aggressive behavior. That's where we would, we would see it. A lot of the family only guys, they're, they're a good citizen. They got clean records. People love them. They've got, they have a lot of things going for them. However, at home, things. We can talk about this for a lot more, but I got a lot more to talk about. Maybe some of the questions will be answered. Okay, that was item number one. Okay, number two is much shorter. If no specific questions are asked regarding the relationship violence, then it is highly unlikely that important issues will not be treated. People in the field of uh, counseling and mental health, uh, th this refers, of course, not to cases that have already been documented like through the legal system is domestic violence, because those we know about. But in general, in the sort of counseling and assessment field, uh, are, the, the numbers are rather shocking in terms of how much people, counselors, do not get about what's happening with domestic violence. And here's a couple of studies that really capture it. One classic one from O'Leary in 1982, uh, there was uh, you know, some sort of mental health clinic Couples are coming in because they, you know, whatever various couples problems that people come in for, and they, uh, in the, over the course of the interview, they uh, they describe their problems to the the, the intake coordinator, who then writes up a summary. Of, you know, here's the target problems. In this particular study, five percent of the couples spontaneously reported violence. Well, it's not they didn't report violence during intake. They reported violence during the the, the actual intake. Yeah, but, whatever, that's a stupid joke. Um, but they, um, 
In other words, 5% of them were identified by the counselors as having some pattern of domestic violence. Then afterwards, they were given the conflict tactics scale, which I'll explain in a minute, which is a questionnaire that says, we, we, in the last six months or last year, has this happened? Have you ever done this? Have this ever been done to you, et cetera? According to that, 66% of them had evidence of domestic violence this point, I think it was either six months or the year preceding. Now, that doesn't mean it was a major issue. I mean, it probably would have come out if it was a major issue, but it was there and it was missed by the counselors. And, and this, if you read the second study, I'm not going to review it. It's a similar kind of gap between what the counselors saw and what the further digging was actually taking place. Well, in that 5%, they probably saw the husband and wife together. Probably the thing. They're doing a self report measure, they're separate. Yeah, the self report so, measure, they're, they're separate, that's right. Right. So, yeah. I mean, she's going to say anything with him in her room. Yeah, so. well, there's, there's a couple of explanations. One is she's afraid of saying anything, and the other is the couple collectively may be in some sort of denial. Well, like, that's right. not that big a deal. The third example, of course, which was a more benign explanation, is and I've had this a couple comes in to see me because of, you know, their arguing about money or they're feeling distant in their relationship with various hundred things that people come in. And I, of course, I'm on top of the domestic violence stuff. I asked about that and they said, well, yeah, you know, nine months ago I got upset and I, I, I pushed him one time. Uh, now, if I hadn't asked that, that probably wouldn't have come out. But it's clear, this is not why they're here. This is not the issue they need to work on. This is, that was a, a one-time thing that was a problem in their relationship at once. It's not anymore. And for me to suddenly jump on and say, okay, we've got domestic violence here. And that's what we've got to treat. That would really be disrespectful, frankly, of what they're what they're looking for. That's not a case of denial. That's a case just of, frankly, putting it in something in a perspective. And believe me, I, if anyone's attentive to the even little examples of domestic violence, it's me. But sometimes uh, I really trust them when they say that's not an issue. That's not what I'm here for. So that's another possible explanation. But the, but, but the numbers are huge. And basically, what I uh, uh, tell people to do is, when you're doing an interview with somebody, you have to make sure that you specifically ask about this. And you don't, you don't ask about it by saying, um, uh, are you an abuser? Or, or, are you, or are you being abused? Because people don't often associate that word with what's happened to them. Uh, you say, you know, the, the standard way I ask it in an interview is, when the two of you are in some sort of conflict, are there any times when it turns physical? Are there any times when either of you puts hands on, pushes, shoves, kicks, throws something, to property destruction, as some sort of way of expressing uh, that you're upset? Does that, does that ever happen between the two of you? So I want to get it very clearly articulated. We know um, from a previous unnamed president of ours, when he's talking about sex, that sometimes you can engage in a sex act and not call it infidelity. <laughs> you, you might call it, I don't know, like, it, it doesn't really count as sexual relations. It's really, yeah, it's, it's sort of, I had an encounter or something. But, uh, and, and, and similar is true with this. I have, uh, I think it was one guy I worked with once who was describing in his group some really horrific thing he had done to his wife. I don't know, we grabbed her and pinned her head down and she ended up with a concussion from it. I mean, just, it's a lot of gory stuff. And, you know, and I said, as we was talking about this, well, okay, let's talk about what was going on for you that led you to do, to hit your wife. And he said, hit my wife. I've never hit my wife. Hitting your wife, hitting is when you take your fist and you, you really pop somebody right in the face. I would never do that to yeah. So he's got some sort of weird notion that a line, I, that's a line I'll never cross. And yet, so many other things he's doing are blatant and flagrant acts of, of abuse, but not hitting my wife. And people do funky things in their heads with, when they try to, uh, with, with that labeling. And so you need to be careful with that. Of course, the other way to assess for this is to use a questionnaire. And I'll talk in a bit about this conflict tactics scale, which is, which is a good standard way of making sure that you get the line items of what's really been taking place in the relationship. Okay, that was good. Now we finish number two. It was a lot shorter than number one. Number three, psychopathy predicts future violence. This sort of goes in the research, uh, tells us what we already know category, but, but we've come up with more research uh, lately about this. The more, the higher somebody scores on psychopathy scales, and I don't have time to go into all the details of what that really means. Um, I'm presuming you've got at least a working knowledge of that term. 
the music psychopath and sociopath interchangeably. Uh, in general, psychopathic criminals, compared to non-psychopathic criminals, are more likely to be violent, use a weapon, target strangers, arouse to sadistic sexual and non-sexual themes, that should be another bullet point, continue to be violent as they age, violently fail when conditionally released, that means on probation uh, or parole, uh, and escape from forensic hospitals. Frank Dunford, who's a researcher at uh, the University of Colorado, he and I worked together for years on these uh, giant uh, domestic violence outcome research projects for the Navy. Um, one, in one of the studies, the Navy studies, he examined the, uh, he assessed the men who were in the, in the domestic violence group for psychopathy. And he found a, a, a random sample of treatment successes. So let's say the key part is um, unsuccessful men in other words, men who recidivated, were identified as recidivating after even after treatment, were more than six times as likely to have PCLSV scores above 12. PCLSV is uh, the psychopathy checklist short version. Uh, in other words, if you were identified on that scale as being up there, not even a full-fledged card-carrying psychopath, but pretty high in psychopathic traits, you are six times as likely to end up not benefiting from treatment. And having repeated, repeated reported incidents of um, domestic violence. So it seems to me if there's, if, if somebody says, tell me about a case, domestic violence case, and said, I'm only telling you one thing about this case uh, to help you predict what's going to happen. The one thing I want to know is, what's the psychopathy score? And the higher that score is, the more I'd say, this guy's more like, is likely to be in a recidivism group, the lower it is, he's less likely to be. Of course, no, no, nothing's a perfect predictor, but that is one of the most powerful ones. And in terms of the terms I've already introduced today, the intimate partner terrorist and the generally violent aggressor, that's where you find the high psychopathy scores. These are the most dangerous guys. Well, the good news is that even in our, the domestic violence world, the type of um, people who end up in our system, most of these people are not psychopaths. Most of them are fall into some of these other categories. But the more the higher the more of those traits that they have, the more overall dangerous and untreatable they are. Okay, that was good. That was number three. Now on number four, um, the conflict tactic scale and what's what's tied to this is women can be violent too. Here I'm getting to some of the juicy and controversial sections. That plus the couples there are really gonna um, get stir things up. First of all, the conflict tactic scale. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, it is, uh, well, let me show you this. Well, actually, let me go through the bullet points and I'll show you. The development of the conflict tactics scale, which was actually first developed, I think, in 1979, maybe even earlier, and has been used repeatedly in different studies uh, since then, uh, allowed researchers to study private domestic violence events. In other words, you don't just say, uh, are you violent, or is there violence in your household? Yes. Did this happened, did this happened, did this happened, did this happen, and how many times? Uh, and it generated some startling info about male versus female domestic violence. And one of the things that it has allowed us to really see is that women can be violent too. Not uh, overall to the same degree or with the same amount of damage overall to this, uh, socially uh, as men can. Uh, but it is not, uh, it used to be considered a myth that women were violent. The only thing female violence was in self-defense. More and more, we're seeing there is a bona fide phenomenon about women. Um, the significant frequency of female to male domestic violence. On a conflict tactic scale, in community wide surveys, they just it's sort of like a census. They go in and you ask a lot of things about your finances and your kids and do you, have you ever stabbed your husband with a knife and other, other sort of like, um, you know, ordinary questions you've asked. Um, but actually, people fill out these surveys anonymously. What we're finding. In 1979, in 1985, in 1993, in 2001, and every time these studies have been done in different communities, the reports of female and male domestic violence throughout the general community are approximately even. And there's there's some, some provisos there, but that's a very that is a, a very startling piece of information that runs that's counterintuitive. I mean, most of us would not have, have thought that, and it's and and there's different ways to try to make sense out of that data. Um, 
women are only sometimes motivated by self-defense. I'll be talking about that in a minute. And the bi-directional violence, with both people involved one way or another, is the most common form of domestic violence. Not in the hardcore cases that you might see in, in shelters. So those of you who work with certain populations, you might think this does not apply. But in the general world of relationships, uh, the bi-directional violence is a more common category than either unidirectional either way. Okay, the conflict tactics scale, I'll just do this briefly. The instructions are this. Please circle how many times you did each of these things in the past year, and how many times your partner did them in the past year. And there are 39 items. And you answer each other twice, once what you did, once when you're on the receiving end of. Um, and the items fall into three general categories. One is things that are that sound like pretty healthy approaches to conflict in a relationship. Two, things that are bad, but not necessarily illegal. And three, there are things that are both bad and illegal. And we'll see if you can guess which of them, which of these items, fall into which categories. I showed my partner I cared, even though he disagreed. Now that's a, a criminal offense, is that correct? No. no. That's a good thing, okay? Even when disagreeing, I was, we were able to do this healthy thing, the kind of relationship repair thing. I insulted or swore at my partner. Is that an illegal act? No, it is not. If, it, if that were an illegal act, we would never have enough money for jails. <laughs> uh, that's, you know, that's a bad thing, and it's, it's, it's destructive, and it, would, and it has bad consequences, but it's not an illegal act. I twisted my partner's arm or hair, and now we're getting down to things that are true criminal behaviors. So sprinkled throughout this, the, the CTS are these various kinds of items. That, and you know, it goes all the way from uh, relatively mild domestic violence, like a push or a shove, to actually using weapons. And, um, and the good news about the CTS is that you get very specific information. Did this happen? Did this happen? Did this happen? Not a global concept about were you abused, but did, did you do this? And has this ever been done to you? That's the good news about it. And you have on the slides some more examples of this. The bad news about the conflict tactics scale, the limitations are the following. It does not assess, this, this, you may not have this slide, but it may not be in, in your sequence. It does not assess context or history. It doesn't look at why somebody was acting this way. For example, it does not assess the possibility of self-defense. If, let's say, I'm, let's say my wife is violent towards me, and, and, and the survey says to me, have you ever grabbed your wife in an argument? I might technically say yes, but what it doesn't say is that that time she was coming at me with a knife. Okay, so but technically on the survey I would have checked off that I committed an act that sounds like violence towards her. Towards her. When I started talking about my wife being violent towards me. Should be good. Deeply 
offended and horrified. Uh, I may be physically hurt because, you know, she hit me pretty hard. But what I'm not likely to feel is fear. I'm not likely to feel that, uh oh, she might kill me. Or she might really beat the crap out of me. Because, no offense to her, but I think I could take her in a fight. I think if I really got out of hand, I believe that I could find a way to restrain her, fend her off, or maybe run faster, or get, get out of the situation, and protect myself physically. If, it, if it's flipped, and I reach, and I cross over that line into violent, violent world with her, she's thinking, if, if this continues, he could kill me. Or, real, or seriously, you know, pound me and, and, and injure me, I might not be able to stop him. That is a profound difference. And it's a very dicey one, because I don't want to damage anybody to sound like it's, like female violence is no big deal. But the reality is that the same act <coughs> compared, to female, compared to female to male does not necessarily carry the same impact. The, the male violence usually carries with it more possible threat of it could get worse. And although female violence is bad, it usually does not carry that particular threat. So that's some ways to try to make sense out of some of the data. And the, the one conclusion I, I come to is from look, looking at all the research we now have about this, um, I come to the conclusion there is definitely a problem called female violence. And when the guys in my groups tell me, you wouldn't believe some of the things that she has done to me, which I used to kind of write off as him, you know, rationalizing and, and uh, Projecting blame. Now, much more often, I actually believe that it's still his job. He's still in there because he has crossed over line himself, and he's got to work on himself. But I believe this phenomenon is real. But it's not. But if somebody is trying to say that it's equal, <coughs> I, I don't believe that that's true either. I don't think it matters to tell you the truth. I don't think it matters if we're talking about a 50-50 phenomenon or an 80-20 phenomenon, as long as whatever percentage of cases in which Though there's a problem with female to male violence, we take those seriously, that's what matters. And that's what the data is telling us that this, this phenomenon doesn't exist. Let talk some more about it. With female offenders, the criminal database, cases that are uh, where arrests and prosecution are made, across, across the country, there's approximately 10% of the cases, uh, the criminal cases, are female to male violence compared to all the uh, percentage of all the domestic violence cases, in other words, 90 to 10. However, the conflict tactic scale tells us it's approximately 50-50. What the heck are we supposed to do with this gap? And some of what is what I just explained to you. Um, we know that uh, women initiate violence nearly as often as men. Uh, however, the violence doesn't necessarily mean the same thing. We also know, and this is a very interesting thing when you try, we're trying to make sense of the power and control theme in male patriarchal society. Same sex domestic violence is approximately the same as uh, heterosexual, so rate domestic violence. So that tells me that the, the main triggers for domestic violence have to do with the complexities of relationships and, and emotional issues and people not handling their feelings very well as opposed to this being governed primarily by a power and control structure in society that one group owns, called men, and another group does not own, called men. I mean, I know that, but there are, certainly that's, that's an important factor that we have to take into consideration at times. But overall, I think if that were the, the primary explanation for heterosexual domestic violence, we would see different numbers in, uh, in the game that's being Shut up! 
You know, he's just hounding me, and I just so I just took this thing and threw it at him just to get him to get out of my face. Engaging his attention. He just wouldn't listen to me. Just sitting there in front of the friggin' TV set with the remote not paying attention to me. Damn it, I just grabbed him and pushed him because he just wouldn't listen to me. To gain control or assert authority. You know, he's been bossing me around. I'm letting him know he can't do that to me anymore. Now, I think if you interview men and ask them what are your motivations for committing acts of domestic violence, you find a lot of similar things. It's because I tried to get her to shut up. I was trying to get her to know how, how upset I was but by the way she was flirting with that guy at that party. And I, that's the only way I could get through to her. You got people who are saying similar things. These are not good, these are not excuses. But it does tell us that our original conception about the self-defense thing, that it plays a much more minor role in most even female domestic violence than we originally thought. Um, Donald Dutton, uh, maybe you know his work from the University of British Columbia. Um, He's put together a lot of, he's looked at a lot of this research. This is a kind of an amended quote from here. Intimacy and psychopathology, rather than gender alone, generates relationship violence. Because of intimacy, the straight and gay rates of abuse are similarly high. The impact of attachment and related anxieties is anger and abuse. Uh, let's go on here. And I think we've covered most of this. Item number five, uh, research trend number five. Uh, why do women and men stay in domestic violence relationships? This is a question that's been asked since day one. And in some ways, the question has been critiqued because the most important question is why do men, or in some cases women, abuse? That's, that's the most, most poignant question. But there still is a key issue here, trying to make sense out of why people stay in Many of us look like destructive, unacceptable relationships to be in. Many stay out of love, not fear, and when they're leaving this most dangerous time. We go through some of these specific. I had the uh, I don't know what I was say, I had the pleasure, the pleasure. I had the experience of running uh, a lot of domestic violence groups during the course of the OJ trial in the early twenties, that was very um, And of course, the issues coming out of the OJ trial come into the conversation of the group a lot. Uh, one of the issues that came up was trying to make sense out of why it was that Nicole Simpson, according to the evidence that came out of the trial, was terrorized or abused on many occasions in which she didn't report it. But there was at least one time, there was the famous 911 call that was in the trial, but there were a lot of other things that came up where something happened, but she never said anything about it. She never released them to the authorities. And so the guys in the group were trying to make sense out of this. What do you think was their leading explanation for why that would be? A woman is, is, is says she's been you know, beaten up or, or threatened by her husband, but she doesn't say anything. Therefore, maybe it wasn't so bad. Exactly. Maybe it wasn't so bad. Because <clears throat> these guys, the guys I'm working with, they all agree. If somebody's being, if, if some woman is really being beaten up by some guy, that's bad. Um, and, that, and she should report it. But if she didn't report it, it means it couldn't have been that big a deal. You know, maybe she did something provocative, she felt guilty about it, or uh, didn't really hurt her that much, these things happen. It <coughs> didn't really count. And it's part of uh, our job to disavow them for that explanation. Because although I suppose that could be true in certain cases, there are many other explanations for why a victim would not want to report this information and get the whole system activated. Here's what we know from the research for some of the leading reasons. Number one is fear of reprisal. We're trying to leave a relationship and calling the police like her husband and having the cops come out and having people in jail can often uh, lead to leaving or can feel to him like you've done something to, to hurt him, like leaving. That increases the risk. The highest frequency of domestic violence comes when the victim in the relationship tries to leave. So I'm a victim. <coughs> situation, I might think, I should leave, I would like to leave, I'm afraid to leave, and I'd rather uh, stay, stick with the status quo than risk it getting worse, which might happen if I leave. Another one, worried about very practical problems, such as loss of money. It's one thing to say, I, my husband is terrorizing me, and I, he 
came home drunk again and did the same thing. I'm not going to put up with this anymore. I'm going to get his ass to jail. This is not. This is going to stop. And of course, if he goes to the jail, then it's going to cost us a lot of money, and he's going to be out of work and he might get fired. And we're really living paycheck to paycheck. What's what's going to happen? And the, the decision might be to not call 911 or, or record this because the actual the outcome that might take place from that might be worse for, for the victim. Or so she might conclude. We're looking at all those things. And other practical things, just like the disruption of the children, or other kinds of dependency issues. You have gay relationships where uh, one of the abused, the, the, the victim, uh, is uh, suffering from AIDS. It needs a lot of care, medical care and attention. And he's thinking, this guy, my, my partner, has been abusive with me. I can't, I can't put up with this anymore. But if I call the cops on him or leave him, who's going to take care of him? Then what's going to, what, I don't have anybody else who can do some of the things that he's going to do for me, so I will choose to stay despite how undesirable it is, but the alternatives are the worst. Then there's shame and fear of exposure. We've seen this in studies, particularly with uh, Asian populations, where shame in the culture is being more prominent than it is in, might be even more shaming than it might be for other, uh, other groups in our society. Uh, a lot of gays and lesbians talk about the second closet door. It's one thing to come out to your friends or family or your coworkers. It's another thing to have to come out to the cops, to the court system, or possibly to a newspaper if there's a report about this. That's a whole different level of coming out that they can neither trust nor have a stomach for. And that could be a reason why somebody would not want to go public, not want to develop the system. Uh, male victims, we'll talk about in a second. Uh, fear of losing the relationship. Uh, it's, 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 sort of, it's not so bad, not so uh, Mistrusting the system. The studies we've seen with uh, uh, Mexican American women talked about how, yes, you know, there, there was abuse going on, but they did not want to activate the Anglo system. They didn't want to have somebody coming to their house and saying, as a self-respecting woman, you shouldn't be putting up with this. This is, if you must, this is a low self-esteem issue on their part, and you really need to change this. They didn't want to have those kinds of values planted into their life or being judged in that thing. The choice is to leave the house, let's deal with it with church, through my family, through getting my brothers go after him, whatever it happens to be, but not the system, because I don't want to get that uh, judgment issue. And then, of course, the last one is the child issue. I guess this is kind of normal. This is what I grew up with, and I guess when people get upset with each other, they get my own. Now, when it comes to the male victim issue, um, let me play you a film. This is from uh, the movie Sideways. How many people have seen Sideways? Okay. Uh, here's what you need to know. Did you ask, this is a low self-esteem issue on your part, and you really need to change it. They didn't want to have those kinds of values planted into their life or being judged in that way. And so the choice instead is, let's keep it in house. And my brothers go after him, whatever it happens to be, but not the system, because I don't want to get that uh, judgment issue. And then, of course, the last one is the childhood issue. I guess this is kind of normal. This is what I grew up with, and I guess when people get upset with each other, they get violent sometimes. So it's not that big a deal. That could be another explanation for why people would stay. Now, when it comes to the male victim issue, uh, let me play you a film clip. This is from uh, the movie Sideways. How many people have seen Sideways? Okay. Uh, here's what you need to know. Uh, so basically about these two guys who are on this, their, this adventure of the wine country in Santa Barbara. One of them is about to get married. He's, this is like his last week, you know, bachelor fling. And during this fling period, he's quickly hooked up with this girl, played by Sandra Owen here, uh, who, they're having this hot, torrid, quickie romance, or whatever you call it. And, uh, but she doesn't know that he's about to get married three days later. But in this scene here, through a series of events, she has just discovered that. I just want you to watch what happens. Hey, baby. I got for a favorite girl. What? Oh, <laughs> 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 
and uh, Dr. Dutton from the University of British Columbia is coming for the second day for that two-day training. That's November 2nd and 3rd. Uh, and we'll be able to apply.
are several. One, it gives us a much richer profile of what's really happening in a couple's life. It's one thing to have a guy in a room talking about what he does at home and how his wife reacts and how they deal with things. It's something else to have the two of them live and really be able to work on it. Secondly, we hear this complaint a lot from the guys in the programs. I'm learning all this stuff about how to do things differently, and she's not. And it's, it would work a lot better if we could both learn these, the, these skills packages. And so it can really come in handy to have that. And the third issue, of course, is that in a lot of relationships, I mean, this is not certainly not true of all, but finding out more and more, there is a certain what's called bi-directionality of violence, where both people have got their own issues about uh, doing psychological and or physical abuse. And it may be that one got targeted and is, uh, is now in the legal system. But there's plenty of stories where both people really need to work on these issues. So those are some of the advantages of uh, couples. As, yes. What would you suggest, because uh, as far as saying that one particular person gets targeted, about the other person, you know, if they don't have insurance, or you know, how do you seek out uh, for the other partner, um, you know, what kind of services do they be giving if they're not there? Well, there's plenty of clinics and low-fee clinics that can see, see somebody, and uh, there's you know victim centers that if somebody's uh, identifying themselves as a victim and wants to be a victim support group, those are usually available in very important ways at different community uh, centers and urban communities like this. Uh, they may not be going to have the access to a private therapist in the community if they don't have funds or insurance, but there's usually, if somebody wants that kind of service, they're usually able to get it. At least it may not be true in some good town in Idaho or something. But in areas like this, I, I think those resources are usually available. Well, my fiance and I are getting focused on we're getting married pretty soon, and he doesn't have Kaiser right now, and they just put it under my number and they want to see me go forward. Yeah, that's, that's another access to the community. I'm assuming on the couple therapy, this is for the family only violence and not that's, for that's the what I'm about we're going to talk about screening. It is highly contraindicated to use any kind of couples intervention if you have any of the following that are taking place. Let me just let me let me do this a little bit different for Couple screening criteria. Let me talk about this. For people who advocate for the selective use of couples counseling, that couple has to meet these criteria to even consider that possibility. And the number one thing here is, if the victim is living in fear, couples counseling will be a very bulletin, unacceptable. But there are a lot of couples where the fear factor is not, is not a current issue. And here's some of the things to look for to help do the screening. One, both people have to desire it. Both people have to say, yes, I think that doing this as a couple would be a good thing for us. And if you have any doubt about the uh, validity of the response, you want to ask these people separately because you don't want her to be saying, it, yes, I think we should do a couple's therapy. I don't really want to. Could be her, her inner, her truest belief. You want to ask them separately if there's any doubt in your life. But if both people are saying, we really believe that this is going to be helpful to us, that's a start. That alone ain't going to do it, but that's a start. Secondly, the violence has to have some sort of relationship basis. In other words, here's, a, here's violence that has a zero relationship basis woman with crystal meth habit who comes home and, start, and starts trashing the house and pounding on her husband uh, when she gets home. Or her husband with an alcohol problem who does the same thing. These are not, we do not have a relationship problem here. We have an individual with a problem who needs help for that individual condition. And uh, the, the person may need victim services, but we do not have a relationship component to, uh, to the issues. In the more often relationships, we see that even though uh, the only person responsible for the violence was the person who committed it, male or female, there's clearly a lot of things going on in that system between the two of them that really, if, if they worked on them, that we would help reduce the risk of that violence taking place. Then it might qualify. Uh, the abuser or abusers are committed to nonviolence. I have people sign, I'll show you this in a minute what I call a relationship respect contract. And 
one of the key things on there is I want people to say, that we believe or we will not continue in this treatment if there are any further acts of physical abuse, violence, or threatening behavior, and a whole lot of other things. In other words, I want these people to say, I know this is wrong. This is not the kind of relationship I want to have. If I have people coming in and saying, well, you know, I don't like getting violent, but I'll tell you, if she starts getting on my case again like that, I don't know what I'm taking on. <coughs> this is not a, we're not doing couples counseling with anybody who uh, talks like that, or who can't fully commit, at least philosophically, to I am determined to not let this happen again. That needs to be clearly stated, and I have to sign it. Uh, no major psychiatric disorder, substance abuse, no significant pattern of power and control issues. In other words, they're not an intimate, they don't, you, there's the coercive control component. It's more of this misguided, cathartic, expressive response. It's more of the situation of couple violence. But if you see, some, see evidence that somebody, typically the male, uh, is engaged in a lot of power and control tactics and intimidation, uh, then this is not a the couple's format, it does not fit. Um, no significant pattern of psychological abuse, no serious lethality, use of weapons, sadistic sex, or bizarre violence, and no stalking or serious obsession with the partner. What we're left here are the more mild and moderate cases of couples who still want to maintain the relationship and who are not living in active fear of his or her partner. In those cases, in, in my opinion, we should at least consider the possibility of, doing, of having a couple's intervention. Now, as you know, in California, uh, couples counseling is not allowed for, uh, at least for legal, you know, cases that are through the legal system. Uh, in San Diego, they're starting to make some exceptions to that. But in general, in most communities, if you're in the state law, clearly, if, if there's a couple's counseling component is not permitted. In other words, if, if an agency is having, has a guy in a, in a treatment program, and they say, you know what, this guy could really benefit from it couples work with his wife and they both want to do that, let's set them up with somebody. That's a violation of the contract. That is not, that you cannot even advocate couples counseling. Not, not only can you not provide it, but you can't advocate it. Uh, at least not until there's some reinterpretation of the law. Uh, so, I'm just, I'm just, in some ways I'm talking about this theoretically, because people working for an the agency don't really have this option. If you're working for a more an agency where somebody's not been busted for specifically specifically for domestic violence, then legally the option exists. And it's just a matter of you know, clinically or professionally whether or not you think that it would be of value. Like if you work for CPS, and the uh, person is not convicted of a domestic violence charge, it may make sense to have the couple together involved in a uh, couple's counseling that focuses on some of the violence the domestic violence between them. Any questions about this part? Good. Um, uh, getting back to this issue about how to distinguish couples uh, involved in violence. Uh, well, this, this comes from the Michael Johnson study. IT is intimate terrorism, and SCV is situational couple violence. We, we come to the conclusion in the first paragraph that couples counseling would be not only inappropriate but dangerous if we've got significant elements of that issue of terrorism stuff going on. Uh, however, for couples involved in situational conflict violence, such counseling might provide useful skills in problem solving, anger management, conflict resolution. Uh, a couple things you should know if you're ever in a situation where it's not. Uh, if it's not yet come to the attention of authorities that there's domestic violence, like you're doing a uh, CPS evaluation, or you're working at a clinic or private practice and seeing see a couple, uh, here's what you're allowed to do and not allowed to do. If it comes to your attention, if you're in a mental health profession, and it comes to your attention that there's been domestic violence, you cannot report that information. Except if it's a clear terrorist off situation, for those who are not familiar with that term, that means that there's an imminent threat reported to you. This guy is saying, I'm, I just found out my wife's been cheating on me, I'm going to go get a gun, I'm going to go kill her. That's terrorism, where you have a specific threat, you got to warn the victim, call the cops, intervene, whatever way you can. But if, but if it's more just more a general thing that sometimes we get into arguments and, and there's a fight and there's some bruises even to show you, you cannot report that without the, the client's consent. 
child, that, that's the next one. The children are supposed to be, yeah. Uh, if the children are exposed, then you, and, and you make an assessment, you consider that to be a form of child abuse, that children are exposed to domestic violence. I do. Uh, some people, uh, you know, waver and say it depends on the situation and various other things. To me, it seems like a no-brainer. Uh, and I would frankly leave, leave it to CPS to determine the severity of what we might consider to be uh, an abusive or abusive environment for the kids to be in. We had an incident recently where um, a father and mother were in one of our exam rooms and the father bloodied the mother's limb in our exam room. And in that case, we felt like we needed to call the police because it was a crime that occurred on our yeah, site. that makes sense, right. That's your interview. You know, she didn't want to. Right, no, no you're in the private state place right in front of you. Yeah, uh, I think <laughs> that one doesn't happen a lot. People usually have a better behavior when you're yeah. in, 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 a, in a police office or a, or a clinic's office or something. Um, and one more that's important to recognize um, elder domestic violence. I, this is something I just found out about a couple years ago. I was giving this training, and, and somebody uh, pointed this out to me. I looked up the law, and they were right. If I'm 65, my wife's 65, and we're sitting, we're in for couples counseling, and it gets reported that I've been violent with her, or vice versa, that's elder abuse, and that needs to be reported. I always thought elder abuse meant that there was somebody in a stronger position, like somebody younger, who was taking advantage, who was abusing somebody in a weaker position, who was by virtue of being old, uh, unable to care for themselves or protect themselves, etc., and that it was a kind of a power imbalance. But apparently not any violence towards person who's 65 or older is a, is a must report uh, elderly situation. And I'm not going to go over this one. I want to talk very briefly about infidelity issues just because if you're working with, uh, well, this applies actually to working with couples with domestic violence or even uh, you know, individuals. Um, the issues of uh, infidelity are so important so much, so much uh, uh, tangled with incidents of domestic violence. It ranks right up there with alcohol and drugs in terms of being a predictor of domestic violence problems. Uh, some of the Dunford research I was talking about, he came up with uh, four different uh, what we call fidelity types. One is the type where there's no uh, suspicion of infidelity. By the, way, by the way, this is not a measure of who's actually cheating on somebody, but the suspicion of it. You're asking the husband or the wife, do you worry or do you think that maybe your husband or your wife is doing this. Fidelity two is husband suspected, wife did not. Three, wife suspected, husband did not. Fidelity and type four is both suspected. And just to make a long story short, 59% of the couples in this sample suspected infidelity in their marriages over a six month period. Uh, and there seems to be a relationship between suspicion of infidelity and more frequent and serious abuse of wives. Um, Wives from couples free of suspicion of infidelity always reported being abused less than when, when uh, less frequently as well as less seriously. Uh, These are just different ways of reporting similar results. Uh, the, the, but one thing to compare it to is that 59% figure, if there was 59% suspicion of infidelity, compare that to uh, having male very low levels of empathy. That's something I think would predict domestic violence. Only 10% of the sample qualified as that. Or male with serious drinking problems. Only 10% qualified at least for serious drinking problems. 14% male low self-esteem. 15% male serious problems with anger. Clinically depressed, 20%. The point is that, there are, that these things are contributors, but a 59% of suspicion of infidelity is a major, I don't know, contributor, but at least a major correlate with uh, both the instance of and and the seriousness and frequency of the rest of the time. Um, and when you get to definitions of ground rules, um, what, I'm gonna, what I have here is the relationship respect contract that I use. Before that, actually, I want to show you um, another film clip. And this is uh, an example of what happens when you get, uh, take two of the most, I'd say the most esteemed, and uh, brilliant psychologists in, uh, frankly, in America, and have them collaborate on a particular case and sort of set up some ground rules for how the things are supposed to go if you're gonna work with a couple with domestic violence in a couple's format. So just watch as these two 
very esteemed, brilliant psychologists, uh, how they approach this. So I'm setting up something about this. <coughs> Also, uh, Dr. David Wexler uh, is here, and he is the executive director of the Relationship Training Institute in San Diego, and is the author of an excellent book, When Good Men Behave Badly. Now, Dr. Wexler specializes in the treatment of abusive men, so welcome to the show. I'm going to be, to be talking to and calling on you guys as we go along through the show. All right, now, Dr. Wexler here, um, who founded and is the executive director of the Relationship Training Institute in San Diego has agreed that he will work with the two of you, specifically starting with you, to stop this behavior. To stop this behavior. Are you willing to submit to that and, and do it? Yeah. Dr. Wexler, what would your plan be here? Where would you start with there? Several key steps to start with. One is <clears throat> there has to be an absolute firm contract between the two of you specifically with you, Aaron, that I am committed to nonviolence. And from you, Michelle, that I'm committed to being in a relationship in which the violence is not acceptable. If those things are really clear, and that's really your vision of the kind of marriage you want to have, then we have something to work with. The next step would be to try to really look at what the strengths are in a relationship. And in particular, and following on some of the other comments that we've heard already today, with you, Aaron, not just labeling you as, oh, this is this guy who screwed up, who does these things to his wife, but where are the qualities in this man that are tender, that are loving, that really want something different, and try to build on that, and to reward that whenever we see it happening. The other key part I think we would really want to work on is what we call the self-talk. That when you enter situations in which you feel in some way disrespected or frustrated by Michelle, Currently, your self-talk is something like, I can't put up with this, a real man wouldn't take this. We need to really help you challenge that self-talk every step of the way so you relabel it so it becomes a real man learns how to be more tolerant. A real man is able to recognize that uh, he's not perfect and she's not perfect and will step up to the plate and handle these things differently. So did they show up in your office? Yeah, yeah. they did. Yeah. <laughs> No, no, that actually does the wrong time. Yes, they do. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I, you know, I agree. Since, since the Dr. Phil show is so short on cash, they asked me to do this work pro bono. Um, so, 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 uh, you know, in exchange for the, you know, all the PR I got from being a Dr. Phil show. Um, so I saw them uh, actually total of eight sessions, and uh, for the most part, it actually went very well. I mean, the, the violence, just completely receded, and they actually started working more on the relationship. There's a lot of, both of them are uh, wounded souls, they have a, you know, a lot of issues, and uh, but they came a long way even though, in those eight sessions, and then I heard later that uh, I offered them to try to hook them up with low-key clinics to continue because I didn't want to see them for the rest of my life, which would have been necessary, actually. Um, but uh, I'm not sure they would even followed up with that. I heard about a year later that they split up, but that's, but that's not, I don't consider that necessarily a disaster. I mean, I consider it, that it's a disaster if they were violent again, I mean, if he was violent again. Um, but, uh, you know, I always like to put couples when things work out for them, but that's to me is not necessarily uh, a sign that something went wrong with them. Um, you know, it was interesting to see them. It was actually very encouraging because the, their story, and the, 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 you know how Dr. Phil does, there's a whole video portraying the things that they've been doing to, this, to each other. Um, sort of tells a story and I got a lot of the background. The story was pretty grisly. But with somebody kind of watching them and really focusing on some of the things that were going wrong, they really looked oh, like a lot better couple. They looked they looked quite different and that's that's always inspiring to me. Um, the relationship respect contract. Here's what I ask people to commit to when they come in to see me for frankly for just about any couple's situation, but it's even more emphasized if there's any issues of abuse going on, physical or uh, emotional. No instance of direct physical abuse or violence. No direct or implied threats of physical abuse or violence. No direct or implied threats to behave in a way that would be extremely harmful to the partner, like revealing secrets, uh, humiliating him or her in some way. Um, no restrictions on either partner's freedom of movement. And I, and people look at me and say, what are you talking about? Here's what I'm talking about. I say to the woman, think of some time, like if 
uh, two of you are arguing about something, and he says, hey, forget it, I can't deal with this anymore. And you stand in the doorway and just try to block his path. That's a restriction on his movement. Or if, so I say to him, if you're really frustrated with her, she doesn't want to, she's not talking to you, and you just grab her and say, you're not leaving her until we finish this, that's a restriction of movement. You may feel justified, the other person may be avoiding, you may not like what they're saying, but you cannot go there. We have to commit this to this ground rule. It is dangerous and destructive to go there. Tempted as you might feel. Uh, no property destruction is aggression. No threats to leave the relationship. And by that I mean, of course if somebody comes to the conclusion that this relationship is not going to work, in our society we have the right to leave the relationship. And certainly if there's violence or even if they're just profoundly unhappy. Uh, however, what I don't want people doing is hurling out threats about leaving the relationship as a tactic when they're pissed off. Like, that's it, I'm out of here, and good luck trying to find somebody else. And then an hour later, the guy comes back. Or, or you know, women can, are just capable of doing that as men. That's not, that, that creates an atmosphere of fear. And, um, and, and a relationship cannot flourish if there's fear, physical fear or psychological fear. Um, no pattern of extreme put downs, character assassinations, or other humiliating acts. And people usually know the difference between saying, I'm really mad at you about this, what's wrong with you, versus saying, you know, you selfish ass, you're stupid, you're ugly, or, uh, or worse. Um, that's, that takes it to a different level. And no infidelity or behaviors which suggest infidelity. Behaviors which suggest infidelity are things like being in chat rooms with, you know, that have a sexual component to them, or inappropriate flirting behavior, or getting phone calls from old girlfriends or boyfriends. Those are things that, that serve as threats to the relationship. There's no way to get anywhere in a couple's format if there are persistent threats to the relationship. And the most extreme threat, of course, is physical, but there's a lot of other ones that are essential to at least having a chance of working this through. Having these things doesn't mean the relationship's going to work. But if you don't have these things, it's almost certain that it's not going to work. Yes? Are these the exact words you use on the Yeah. Yeah. It's actually, I, I cut it down a little bit for the chart, I mean for the slide, but it's pretty much the same. Yeah, I mean, there's a space saying they sign, you know, the date and sign, and I sign as a witness. And, you know, it's, it sort of formalizes the, the contract. It's not just like, yeah, 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 we agree. You put your name to it, you take it more seriously. You put your signature to it. Um, I had a, a, a couple more slides that I'm not going to have time to do, but it just, there's some strategies that I like to use with couples, but. Uh, you can look those over and you may find a few things that are helpful to you. I do want to leave, I mean, we got three minutes left. Uh, I, I, I'm a professional workshop presenter and I know when they say end at 10.30, you end at 10.30 and people start getting restless. So I'm going to make sure you're out of here at that time. Uh, any uh, questions you want to ask me in a couple of minutes? Yes? Is there a real high percentage of abusers who have witnessed their parents being abusers? Yes. Uh, that's in the female population, women who end up in female domestic violence treatment programs, the frequency of abuse, sexual and or physical and or witnessing parental abuse is astronomical. Uh, I don't know the exact numbers I have, but it's somewhere in the 80 to 90 percent range. In the males, it's also much higher than the general population, but not that high. Uh, but, but I'm just, I'm saying, if your question is about men, yes, the answer, many of the guys who end up committing acts of domestic violence have witnessed uh, their father being violent with their mother, or sometimes the other way around, but mostly not. And also, many have been on the receiving end of violence themselves. But it's interesting what the research shows, that if there were, if you look at those two different stories, one is where I'm a boy, I observed violence. Another one is I'm a boy, and I've been on the, I've been on the receiving end of violence. The one that predicts my likelihood to commit domestic violence is the first one. The observation of a male behaving in this way towards a woman is more likely to contribute to that outcome than the receiving it. The worst combination, of course, is when there's both. But in fact, I think one study I said, I was shown, was shown said that um, if, if the combination is there, it increases the likelihood of that boy becoming a domestic violence offender as an adult 12 times. I think it's six times if you just observe, three times if you're on the receiving end, and combined, 12. So I, when I, I, I quote those studies to the guys in my group, I'm saying, look, 
if you want your kid to turn out to be somebody who doesn't beat his wife, make sure you're abusive with him and you're going to observe you being abusive with your wife. That will that will make it twelve times more likely that's gonna happen. Well the studies I'm talking about are strictly physical, but I'm, there's probably you can probably guess that it'll be similar for predicting um, emotional styles or in, in arguing or relationship conflicts. Any other questions? Run once, run twice, one last thing I want to say. I just want to thank you. This is the work we are all doing is sacred work. Uh, dealing with these kinds of issues of any end of the the defenders, dealing with victims, dealing with kids. Any aspect of the system is this is a mission. This is not just a job, this is a mission. And uh, I really appreciate all of you being here and having the opportunity to exchange ideas with you. Good luck to all of you. Hope to see you again.